All right, hello everyone. Um, I am so excited about this event. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Everyone can see me, I'm hoping, and hear me, I guess. Um, but welcome. Oh, hey, hey team. Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us here today for our second Home in the Bay event. Um, it's been a really hard week for everyone. And I hope you all are finding care and rest. Um, and I think that's why this event is so important, at least to me. Um, these times are hard and it helps me to be reminded that we have community here uh, and caring for each other is the most radical way we can make the world a better and safer place. Um, with that said, I wanna invite into the space that we are holding together, whatever feelings you may be sitting with, um, my name is Emma, my pronouns are she and her, and I am the Director of Acquisitions and Programming at Antloot Books, um, an intersectional feminist press dedicated to publishing literature by those who have been traditionally underrepresented in or excluded by the literary canon. Um, and we have such an amazing lineup of readers today. I'm really excited and also feeling like needy for this medicine. Um, but before we get to know everyone and uh, get to know our MC, I want to acknowledge that Antlute operates um, on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramai Tosholoni, uh, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula as the indigenous stewards of this land. And in accordance with their traditions, the Ramai Tosholoni have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland, and we wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, the elders, and the relatives, their Maitish um, community, and by affirming their sovereign rights as first peoples. And the statement serves as an ongoing commitment to solidarity with the indigenous and first peoples here, um, and while Antloot is located in Ramaita Shaloni land, I'm currently calling in on Lishan Ohlone land in Oakland. Um, and I encourage you all to pop into our chat and share the land that you are joining us from. Please pay your land tax if you haven't yet and you're in the Bay. Sagarayate Land Trust, uh, which is a partner organization of this project, runs the Shumi land tax uh, and will include links in the chat. Um, but paying your land taxes, how you can support the work of rematriating this land. Um, some announcements, uh, this event is being recorded and it will be published online later this week. Um, we'll send it out to everyone who's RSVP'd and to you all. Um, and we'll also publish it on the Antloot website. So if you need to dip out at any point, you'll certainly be able to catch the rest um, and the full event on your own time. We also have subtitles going and I'm hoping that everyone else can see them if they need. Um, yeah, good. Um, but please, you know, subtitles are not always um, excellent. Uh, send messages into the chat if you want clarity on anything said and the Antloot team will try to hop in and help uh, clarify. And we wanna do our best to make this experience as accessible as possible. Um, Lastly, we have an interactive presentation that I am linking into the chat. Um, and it was just playing as you all were shuffling in and we'll continue to resend it throughout the event. Um, it's there that you can find more information about every reader and organization and all the books and projects and everything we're talking about here. Um, and it's also where you can find information for how to support everyone you're seeing here. Uh, we have links to buy books, we have contact information, donation information. Uh, part of being in this community is the flow of support. Um, and we encourage you to hop in there, add in your own links for people in the Bay seeking mutual aid, Bay Area artists you wanna bring attention to, or if you just wanna start conversations, you have feelings, you wanna talk about home. Uh, but without further ado, I am so happy to introduce Kim Shuck, who is our humanities advisor for this project and our guide for this evening's journey. Um, She's an established poet, activist, community organizer, editor, weaver, storyteller. And I had the honor of meeting Kim at a random grant event uh, when I was first getting started at Antloot. And I've never been so quickly invited to any stranger's home 
for spaghetti. Yeah. And to talk angrily about how none of us are paid enough. Yeah. Felt great. She's the only person I know who has received direct death threats from the KKK, which is a great accomplishment. If a disturbing reminder of why we so desperately need community. Welcome, Kim. Thank you, Emma, and thank you for your almost instant and deep friendship. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, if I could figure out uh, where on my resume to put that I'd had a death threat from the KKK, I would have it there because I feel like it's one of the jobs of being a poet. So I was asked to say a few things about home as a concept. When we do these land acknowledgements, what I need people to understand is that it goes very deep. Um, the, we're made out of the land that we live on generationally and uh, the land returns the favor by making itself out of us. It's, it's, a, it's a very deep connection and it doesn't deny the more recent connections, but it's um, just important to acknowledge how very cellular that becomes. We take care of the land, the land takes care of us, not as a theory, but as a reality. And um, uh, the gentrification process tears up not just the actual physical space, but it also tears apart communities that have developed over long periods of time. And part of this project was to witness for one another and to recognize those connections and um, to uh, you know, acknowledge and value them, um, even as they're being frayed. Um, so without further ado, because there are some time constraints, I'm going to introduce uh, Poe Poets. Um, the Poe Poets, houseless indigenous Poe Poets, co-founders of Homefulness, Israel Munoz, Uteado Silencio, and Amir Cornish, and Poverty Scala, aka Tiny Gray Garcia, have some important words to share with you. Welcome to this space, Po Poets. Always good to see you here. Hey, welcome to Po Poets uh, Project. I am Amir Cornish from the West Coast. I broke the school chains that tried to break me down inside their real twisted system. They said my disability would help me down, but instead helped me to rise a glory to fight another battle. Um, Israel Munoz. This is for all the people that look at us up and down and they don't know why we come to this town. We come to support indigenous black and brown to take back their own town. Oh, oh. Muteado silencio presente y me alegro. Mis palabras son mis balas, mi lapis es mi arma. Muteado silencio, our words, our bullets, our pen is our gun. So sit back and relax, cause we're gonna drop out your minds. The Popo is Project, a poor magazine. Wee. See that houseless mom and daughter sleeping in a tent? Do you see that houseless mom and daughter sleeping in a tent? That's because we don't got money for the rent. Yeah, I'm a poverty scholar, that houseless mama, that houseless daughter. And every day my body is evicted, swept, and kicked. Cause settler towns like this don't give a shit. I rock my jailhouse attire cause me and my poor mama did jail time for the poverty crime of being houseless in this occupied indigenous holler. I'm a poverty scholar the melanin challenge daughter of a strong Afro-Bodico mama for without whom there would be no me, a mama so dead and a welfare queen. I, I wanna call out that my brother Multiado Silencio is one of the poor press authors this year with his beautiful book, Chimali. I wanna call out two youth scholars in the room. There's also Akil Carillo, uh, Decolonized Academy, and Amir Cornish, 
uh, who are both graduates of Decolonize Academy, a liberation school run by poor people for poor children to liberate the education that they continue to oppress our nation with uh, lies about Mama Earth, about history, history, and all of the genocide of removal. And I'm so blessed and honored to be on this call that all of us are with Sister Flea Flea uh, family and part of our Poor Magazine family and Homefulness, as well as Kim and so many more of you. Thank you for listening. Um, I always recognize that we are here not only on stolen and occupied land, but on the shoulders oh. of our ancestors. Oh. Uh, and I am the daughter of a broken, disabled Afro-Indigenous mama who barely made it, who had a dream to not be uh, caught in the isolation nation, in the criminalization uh, of the lie of poverty, the colonial crafted lie of homelessness, and had a dream while still on the street of homefulness. And so we sit here as members, as residents of folks who for the first time in our poor lives are home full because of a poor people led solution. As we often say, change won't come from a savior, a pimp or an institution. institution. Change will only come, come from, from a poor, poor people led revolution. revolution. So I'm gonna close out our, we only spending a little bit of time with y'all, but I'm gonna close out with a, a poem song that I did for my mama and I did for mama earth. Mm. It's, uh, it's essentially to this tune of, um, there's a house in New Orleans, for any of y'all know that song, it was one of my mama's favorites. There is a house in East Uchin, they call it homefulness. And it's been the dream of many a poor girl. And God, I know I'm one. My mama was disabled tortured as a child. My father was a rich white man who left us all to die. Now the only thing a poor mama needs are hands to hold her broken dreams. But mama and me were all alone. So instead we lived hidden on the street. Mama and me were broken, barely made it out alive. But no matter what, mama refused to believe in the settler colonial lies. Sometimes the pain is too hard. Mama said, I can't go on, but walk this change on this Ohlone land and build us all a home. There is a house in East Uchin, they call it homefulness, and it's been the home of many a poor girl and boy, and God, I know we are them. Oh, Mateo. Oh, Thank Mateo. you, everybody. I just wanted to point out that the Poverty Scholarship, that's poor people led theory, art, words, and tears across Mama Earth that actually has an opening by Sister Ooh. Karina um, and so many more beautiful poverty scholars. And we also teach people school because the only way us poor people could build this poor people led vision is with housed and privileged people kicking down radical redistribution, which we teach at People School next session on Zoom or in person in Black August 27th and 28th, um, poormagazine.org. And lastly, that poem you just heard is in my new collection called The Sidewalk Motel. Oh, Mateo. Thank you, everybody. All power to the people. All power, power to, to the people. people. I cannot recommend the books that come out of uh, the Poe Poets and the Poverty Scholars publications enough. There, I have not ever been disappointed. So I encourage you to buy them. I encourage you to encourage libraries to have them as well. Um, they're always amazing. Thank you for being here with us, guys. Our next reader is Fukuoka Nimikolu, PhD. She is a Tongan scholar, storyteller, community organizer. She, current, she is currently a University of California President's Postdoctoral Fellow at the University of California, Davis. And in fall 2023, she will be an Assistant Professor of Critical Race and Ethnic Studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz, 
and they could not be luckier to have her. She is also a stellar human being. Um, please welcome to Fuji. Hey, Malo, Malo. <laughs> wow, wow. So beautiful to be here. My heart is so, so blessed to be here. Malo um, Dalava Gaina. I forgot the low watu, but my forgot the tai. Gihe gaina aloni, gihe gaina dauhi or fonwani. And also, maloi naoe to travel chair Karina Gold, who is also part of this circle tonight. Malo, malo, malo Karina Gold, maloe puke puke fonua, the maloe dauhi or dawa. You know, relatives, it is, it is, I. I'm so I'm so humbled to be here, to be here with all of you. You know, in our meeting just earlier, I was just telling a quick story that I was in some meetings earlier today that I couldn't help but, but cry. And for me, that's I always I think that it's where that is a meeting of where poetry is is conceived and where our role as poets also come alive. Relatives, I was at a I was at a, at Kaiser sitting in a room of young women and also older men. We were all waiting for our radiation because every single one of us in that room were survivors of cancer. And so I say that with great humility because you know, um, it is actually Auntie Kim Shock who in introduced me. And I wanna say, Kim, thank you for showing me. Thank you for showing me on how to live. Thank you for showing me and so many others how to live this life and the importance of poetry at this time of great crisis and surviving. And you know, my family uh, came right before us. And how do you thank a family like that? For all the many years it took me to do this PhD dissertation, I always wanna say this story it took me 13 years and even much more to do that undergraduate, to be in that man's school, as my sister, Tiny Gray Garcia always tells. I couldn't write because the, the work was on sexual violence. And it was, it was actually Kim Shuck. And it was my sister, Lisa Tiny Gray Garcia and all the relatives at Poor Magazine who helped me write. I know I don't have a lot of time relatives to read, to tell the stories that I have tonight. You know, as a Tongan, it's our prodigal. It's our prodigal to always show our gratitude. And so that is also part of the offering and that's also part of the performance and the writing. So I really wanna say with great gratitude to the sisters and the brothers who came before me and who helped me to write. The first poem uh, relatives that I wanna uh, share is it's actually one that was done a while ago. And I was, I was really feeling it today. And I was actually feeling it more than reading my, my new work. So, so let, let me share it with you. It's called Ellie's Story. The bright lights of the city surround her like flies. She mumbles a prayer learned in Sunday school and holds on tightly to the cold air. Hope, hope funnels through her fingers like the daughter her parents couldn't keep. You see, two weeks ago, she fled her home in Utah, fleeing the grasp of the Mormon church and her parents' shame. Freshly pickled like the apricots church leaders taught her to preserve every autumn, a skill that promised to make her into a good wife. Tonight, on the corner of Sepulveda Boulevard, bright lights expose the blue bruises on her body, disguising her as an older woman. She is her mother, her grandmothers, lingering in dark corners, abandoning guests and the tedium of polite conversations. You see, 3 a.m., she telephones her mother, Lithia, pleading for her life. For a cusp, of, a cusp of warmth to quell the cold. She imagines that their shared silences 
histories of bruised abdomen and crushed collarbones at the hands of men were reasons, were reasons enough to reconnect them, bury the aching distance and reunite them. But the silence on the other end hangs and festers like a wound. She is reminded that in her family, there are only sons. Thank you so much, everybody. You know, the next poem that I'm gonna read uh, is, is also a, an older poem. Uh, it's a poem that actually Kim helped me uh, to write and to, and to come back into poetry. And this next poem is a poem that is also important because, especially because uh, Karina Gold, the steward, uh, the keeper of the sacred, uh, the West Berkeley Shell Mound, the oldest sacred Shell Mound here in the Bay Area, um, is also here in part, and is part of this Delanoir of this uh, conversation tonight. So this piece is called From the West Berkeley Shell Mound to Moana Nui. Story number one, the desecration. The desecration of the sacred, violence against her native woman body, persistent upon his arrival. He brought out all the instruments of progress, baptized and renamed her Berkeley. Her body submerged under him, he is heavy and unrelenting as empire. Her plaited black hair he wrangled into platitudes, singed the iridescent strands to silence. He is the weight of asphalt, a lonely parking lot. His ownership of her he terms as, quote, freedom. Story number two the Tongan Mormon baptism ceremony. I am an eight year old girl at my Mormon baptism ceremony in a small chapel in Maufanga Tonga. My hair is plaited and split in two, a division so inconsolable. My mother tenderly tied the wounds with bright white ribbons to mark this moment. The missionaries termed as quote, coming of the light. His priesthood authority intrusive, like the bleached baptismal water surrounds me. My black hair contorted in their nets, severing the cycles of memories until I am no longer able to discern my breath from drowning. He renames me, declaring the mana on behalf of his gods bounded my feet with ropes made from woven human hair, lined with spears and whale bones tied with knotted fowl, baptized and converted me into a carcass of an obedient daughter and wife. This moment, this moment, he proudly records in his missionary diary as quote, light. Story number three, hash, hashtag, we are still here. The West Berkeley shell mound, her native woman body rests under asphalt, luminous mana silenced by a parking lot, man-made and mundane. She is their private property, owned by a white settler family who refused to negotiate with Indians. On the battlegrounds in Huchin and in Uiha, under the hands of missionaries and mercenaries, our children's bones hung from trees like decomposed fakika fruit. The flagrant sour taste on our tongues. Relatives, when we thought all was lost, when we thought all was lost, the secret was there. She picked up our memories, ancestors left for dead. She fed our mouths with the flesh of sweet acorn and salt water from her breasts, from her breasts until we grew strong, fearless. 
She weaves the circuitous dance of death and birth into her long black hair. Dream times exchange through collective breaths from our Mona Nui to Hu Chin. She cuffs origin stories birthed before his arrival, innumerable constellations. They grow in our altar like the flowing yellow poor garlands in our hair. Yes, relatives, she is survivor, creation, creator, always here. Yes, we remember the stories of us after the missionary and the mercenary are gone. Relatives, malo apito, malo apito, uh, relatives for sharing your time with me. Thank you so much again to Aunt Lou Books uh, for this opportunity to be in conversation. So much love to all of you and your families. Thank you so much, Fui. Um, it's a good reminder that we're more than the things that are taken from us. Yeah. And that it's really important also in moments like this to witness for one another. At this time, I would like to introduce Landon Smith, who is a father, a professor, a poet, half Mende and half Balanta and Fulani, the Amethyst Geode on your desk, Angela Davis's Afro, Franz Fanon's pocket notebook, Walter Rodney's fingernail, the seven to 10 Bowen split, your favorite pillow. Despite his institutional degrees, he really became a poet through the East Side Arts Alliance in Oakland. Landon thanks his sister, Alia, for buying him his first journal, Brit Hill for pushing him to read poetry in public, and Black Freighter Press for publishing his first book, No Bedtime Stories of Soil, Abolish All Prisons and Police, Landon. Uh, thank you, and uh, you know, thank you to everybody for this opportunity and for sharing space. <clears throat> uh, if you don't carve out a healing space, a legislator might use your flesh for sacrifice. Fascism fed farm to table, grassroots campaign can't rid the stench of shit in the soil. National Guard on bureaucrat speed dial. Hey, tell them niggers not to loot or air fresheners going to a blood on the ready-made caskets. Bodies of black women sacrificed for collective white comfort. We have seen this script before. Yet y'all still ready to hold knives up to black arteries. Democracy just a fable we rode past. Crossing into this cemetery we wake up in on a loop for the shards of black protest to get beaten into another voter campaign for Obama to stand next to a black woman waving clinking chains of Asada, grinding bones into soil backed by Biden budgets, virtue signaling progress just to express shit billy clubs and kill the English dictionary in you and you might be a revolutionary by nightfall. Off your last breath to the asphalt, it'll ask if you at least fought back. Ask if you apologize to all the minute hands. Chain holder made a quilt out of your ancestors. Sewed it loosely and told you let it keep you warm. Never had a dream within this colonial opiate. Capitalists other to railroad worker than Silk Road trade them for dirt. Threw pigs at a labor strike and watched the bodies fall. Greasy palms oil prison pipelines while the moderate preachers reform. Property tax still funding school budgets and they got the nerve telling me to grab a picket sign while a rock laying right here. Smoking mirrors bringing in fighting over blood money. All money is blood money. Thought we made it out the cotton fields just to be grandfathered in. Heard a whip crack in a handcuff class, in a sentencing hearing, in a salary negotiation behind bulletproof plantation windows, and I drag infected minds through the broken tires of my unread poems. McCarthy has been smashed into my dinner plate, hoping to crack the communists from my swollen red knuckles. John Ehrlichman shoulder shrugs my car upside down to the part of foothill buried in flashing patrol lights, while Reaganism hovers above my neighborhood like smog in my kids' new lungs. Biden era pinstrokes flood Lake Merritt with pay stations hoping to drown out sideshows. There is blood on your overcoat, Libby. What good 
is a progressive leech, Libby. If I will still be three courts low after the confirmation hearing confirms me to be a necessary sacrifice on the white Jesus altar of justice, harmonizing about the beauty in my execution. South Carolina firing squad triggering my last rights before I become a useful bullet in the throat of my comrades. While empire sells bombs in the name of my great grandmother's dirt scraped knees. And meanwhile, I drag my lineage through dirt roads Sandstorm scraping knees on cement center blocks stacked in the way my wrist cut deeply on a journey salt water stinging bone showing before someone else tells me I'm healed tells me to move on when I drag lineage by their wrists wiping off eraser dust mixed with diamond flakes they sold back to us saying that's all our hands were good for losing limbs between borders some European gave name to that I should be proud of that Sing Bay PA revolted to come back to maybe my wrist bleed on the chains he broke just to be Spielberg in white saviorhood I feel my lineage weighted down beneath Volongo wharf remains paved over just to be paved over just to be built to top under silk covers smelling like liberation strangleholds while I drag lineage to a native language not a native language in hopes of speaking with lineage between borders and sandstorms I was told I didn't need to know enough mende for struggle I drag lineage with dislocated wrists separated at the broken tree branch telling stories to a tall tale and contradiction and sand in my shoes meanwhile there are two less feet in a tent this evening. And somewhere, a prison guard gives another close fist speech about order. The air thins above a tent pole eviction notice, while a new jumpsuit is handed to a tooth on a cement floor. A Nikki Bass photo shoot next to gentrified housing while Noel Gallo votes to steal more Fruitvale money into patrol cars. Leech Van Ray to pile up bodies just to bleed corners drive for development while Gary Yee red tags another black school for prison bed construction. At least there will be clean street corners, a dirty mouth in a suit will say. At least there will be law and order. Dust is always better when swept under a rug, or at least onto the next encampment and three tents blown on the other side of 580 will lower property value and more protest signs to pop up just to be ignored next week because I'm on pace to be called a nigger 212 times by summer. It is January and there are only 10 days left in this month and I refuse to be a corpse by the third but catch me fist closed on the fourth and I might be gone by the fifth if this white woman in power has her way, which is the same as that white man in that seat, which is the same as that last missed check, which is the same as that eviction notice, my mother says the cloth of my ancestors makes me bulletproof. So I put on a new head wrap every time passive aggressive headshots fire off of cradle tongues down into the gutters of unswept streets where I'm told that I belong. And I walk around with cash just in case I pass another cardboard sign, giving a fortune to crates just to see more hungry mouths the next month. It's almost like I cannot fix these encampments on my own, like starvation is intentional, like billions in surplus don't exist. Maybe by the end of this poem, you can tell me what the cause is. While I kick three more election pamphlets off my doorstep since I don't do drugs on Tuesdays ever since my neighbor overdosed on Kamala Harris bumper stickers. Meanwhile, the city of San Francisco made 90 million in parking tickets just to not have affordable housing just to hire more pigs to put tickets on windshields to pay for pigs putting tickets on windshields and my last 60 dollars goes to the cardboard sign again you know a fist fight is always fair to the waistband with the gun tucked inside you know an eviction is always fair to the feet standing on a bankroll and my cousin told me that not all skin folk are kin folk. So I keep two feet in my back pocket. So I land on my feet when I'm sucker punched between line breaks and the neoliberal slides a judge lump sums to slide me into solitary silence so that a white tenure professor can tell you that these are not poems, that these are lyrics, that these are a soapbox, and that they are too unhoused and must cut their hair before they deserve a home. But a real poet told me once, that not every story needs to appeal to the heart. It can appeal to the spine. Sever vertebrae shout and hear me out from straight jacket buckles and scratches on cement walls that made my spine property of the state. That made me two thirds of a past the future left bloodstained baton swing. Slush from bomb exploding outside what used to be my bedroom wall just long enough for the taste of rubble to be family heirloom. Nobody even asked where I wanted my body to be buried. I'm talking to this soil. Like everything is a weapon formed against me. Melatonin making mega ever is my docent on this impending bullet train. Woke up 10 times lost. Coroner can tell you jokes three minutes past America if you wait long enough, might diagnose you as a rebel if you speak too loudly about the cause of death. Every 20 minutes, another puppet dies by teleprompter. Tells a revolutionary to just vote if they want change. Tucks in sheets on deathbed for preparation. Hell, how are you gonna make it out alive anyway? 
You might as well laugh through that ash coat and lungs. We used to breathe air. Now all we do is drink water and pray to the fire next time. Burning flag flapping around a body somebody deemed illegal somewhere. Drew a border and said, I dare you to cross. Let's see if your lungs can take in more air than this bullet can take from you. First step is to dare you to dream. Second step, get you to fall in love with the sound of a growling stomach. Third step is to put you on a postcard sacrifice to a tree branch. What good is the poet with no neck, the coroner will joke. Only half of half of the half he spoke to listened anyway. My burial plot placed center stage for encore viewing. Floating on the Sierra Leone River, I am less weight than tree. Tree telling my neck it meant to shield me before I became a dash somewhere within this project where I can't even float. You know, a white poet told me once that not every poem needs to be a revolution. Like my pen not attached to a fist with scab knuckles from punching through oak memories, trying to talk to my uncle in Haiti I never met, who's trying to talk to my aunt's headstone in Brazil. These crop dusted palms never got to touch. I must be a carpenter. From all these splinters, stinging white prayer circles gathered around stapled corners. I was born a poet. And I have hitchhiked my way to a last meal beneath this tree. So let me pause for a second and see just how much Sierra Leone is left beneath my fingernails. Uh, thank you. Uh, go ahead and drop this, the link for the book, uh, which is available 7-7 uh, from Black Freighter Press. It's available for pre-order. Again, thank y'all for having me in the space. Thank you for sharing space and I appreciate, uh, appreciate being here. I feel absolutely certain that I am not the only person thinking it might be a great idea to order that book. So go ahead and check that out in the chat. Our next reader is another person I'm really glad to see the face of today. Marcia and Wynn's most recent poetry collection is Storage Unit for the Spirit House out of Omnidon Press 2020 which was nominated for the Northern California Book Award in Poetry, longlisted for the Pen America Open Book Award, and shortlisted for the California Independent Bookseller Alliance's Golden Coffee Award. Ma Shane Nguyen is a stellar, stellar poet, and I'm honored to call her friend. Please welcome her to this space. Thank you, Kim. Um, thank you, Kim. Thank you, Emma and Aunt Loop Books. And um, it's so good to be here tonight with um, you amazing, powerful poets. This is a fairly recent poem and it's called Vertigo Log. Vertigo Log, L sent a group text on International Women's Day. L has vertigo, my fourth friend to come down. I Google dizziness, vertigo, women, Bay Area. A coworker says to me on the phone that empaths are suffering these days. Illness, aging parents, overwhelm. I try to remember to breathe, sit on the balcony, eyes closed to the sun. I FaceTime a bakuni. She is my mother. The caregiver believes the abbess is slipping herbs into the water to make her sleep untrue. The earth rotates around the sun, balancing act on axis. Summer is winter, fall is spring. Ground shifts below us. Today, I bring mushroom soup to L. A student emails me during class, mentally burnt out, can't focus. Each week I meet R in Zoom. We share our worries. We begin to write. And now I'd like to share a couple poems from Storage Unit for the Spirit House. Sky Space Two, found round stone, in gutter, felt lighter. School bus arrived. Stone remained in center of palm. Pink sky through window, oval cloud. 
felt stone in palm and recalled a father who held a mug made of gold. Wallpaper in dining room, a forest to wonder. Counted people on sidewalk. Girl pulling wagon under freeway overpass. Stone cold in hand. Girl cold in air. Gold forest. Factory. Blindfold wound around a bleeding head. Sepia time cards and combination locks. Sound of coworkers arguing in the bathroom or the other way around. Crows captured in dim light, a murder mystery for a limited audience. Pupils of soft brazen green Lacquerware box in an abandoned mall. Factory workers assembling cell phones and wheelchairs. A scorpion in the break room. And now I'd like to end with two more recent poems. And this is called Trance Log. We are writing from our dreams. I am not asleep. I hold one hand in the other. We notice the topography of our palms. We notice our lifeline has grown longer, our fate line shorter. I see the pain flow in channels from three scars on abdomen. We itch. We sense it along the torso, down the arm, through the hand. We hypnotize. I see my sister's long fingers in our hands. We face our palms upward. I realize that my lines have aged. We hold our hands up to our face and stay there. I think about our sisters. We touch their feet. You write about last night's dream. You close our eyes. We dream in trance. I stand to eat from my plate. We sleep off the breadcrumbs. And this is my final poem, and it's called Letters from the Waiting Room. Dear H, I'm hanging out in the waiting room. I am blinking into another eye. Gold shades, sirens again. Seeing another city through the window of another's window. I live in a two second time lapse. Dear H, I knitted a quilt for you. Slivers of green lint throughout. Warmth in the waiting room now. My limbs are soft with pain. Slept last night with ears open, noted the following, pollen drift, vessel crack, pillar bark. Dear H, missing your dry arms, crackling eyes, generous fountains, and this, you were standing on a dock and next to you, a large trunk made of bone. Strangers began to gather. You sunk your hand and lifted a spinning plate from the trunk, applause and more applause. Dear H, my cat visited me from the other world. She witnessed bliss busting from the pockets of houses open once again. Bright light from the storehouse, tinny bell tones. She could smell the dirt from behind the shed. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Mom. Our next reader, Norman Antonio Zelaya, was born and raised in San Francisco, California. And I know that he was, because I saw him there. He has published stories in Ziziva, New York Tyrant, 14 Hills, Botany, and Apogee Journal, among others. 
He was a 2015 Zoetrope All Story finalist and a 2019 Angina Scholarship recipient for Latinx writers to attend the Community of Writers Workshop in Squaw Valley, California. In 1997, he co-founded uh, Los Delegados and has performed extensively through the US with them. Zelaya has appeared on stage, in film, and in the squared circle as Luchador Superfoca. Orlando and Other Stories, Pacino Press, Oakland, California, 2019, was his first published book. His new book, Hinting, Folks, Black Freighter Press, San Francisco, California, will be released in July 2022. Please welcome Norman Zelaya. Thank you very much, Kim. Uh, I'm happy to be here with everybody. Uh, just thinking about home and, and the Bay, like home is always a, a big part of what I write, has always been and always will be. There's a small pond in the pit on 22nd Street in Mission. After a four alarm fire burned down the large apartment building, Dozens of units charred and exposed like dung beetles turned over lakes to the sky. Months later, bulldozers came and knocked down the hollowed back end shell left behind and then cleaned out the foundation. It wasn't only apartments. It was dental offices from teeth cleanings to braces and a travel agency that promoted Paca Airlines and covered the walls with posters of Pan Am offering future flights to the moon. Tax preparers and immigration lawyers who were all notary publics that, that could officiate weddings too, an entire ground floor of commercial spaces. The mission market with produce and meat, beef, pork, chicken, de rancho, fresh chorizo and longaniza strung across the back wall. A floor is tucked in a space no bigger than a toll booth where she stood all day clipping stems and curling pink and really stones with her shears. A Cambodian donut shop, enormous glazed braids, heavy apple fritters, the ladies chattering all at once to serve. What else? What else? You want coffee? Or Barbara sitting in a single chair with the newspaper snapped open, waiting for walk-ins. La Artenia Taqueria with the deep salsa bar and specialty fish tacos and Sanada style. A shoe store that also sold ladies' fashions. A tailor, a young girl who had worked years for the old man who had his tailor shop for decades just up the street. But he didn't listen. Never got the hems right because he was a square. And his taste hadn't changed since he arrived in the barrio in 1975. And he wasn't nearly as hip as 75, but she was cool, had a touch. A pupusa stand, the two doñas forever, backs to the customers, fleshy arms, working their six cents. Que quieres amor? And Popeye's chicken, I line out the door every Tuesday. At one time, that was a video arcade where I got hip to Super Pac-Man and Donkey Kong Jr., the new shit. The building was five stories of bustling life. How did the people on the upper floors get out through those narrow hallways? Soles and heels sticking to the nylon runners that covered them. No one took the elevators. Antique cages only moved four passengers at a time. No one dropped the ladders from the fire escapes. They stepped quickly as they could, hands on the shoulders of those in front, descended the squared staircases that spiraled down the center of the building deafening with shouts and clanging of alarms and stifling and smoky, but they all made it out, except for one viejito, el pobre. The fire raced for hours. It lit up the sky, amber gleams surging against the blackness. Typically, the sky was started because of all the street lamps and neon signs along Mission. It was dull, forgettable, but that night, the sky was immense, fathomless. It moved, gaping. There had to be lots of smoke billowing. It was lost in all that pitch. The emptiness left behind is enormous, deep and rectangular like a landfill. The pit reminds me of the one left behind on 16th in Valencia, where a hotel burned, the Gartland, condemned and later destroyed by landlord Arson when I was a kid, 12 dead. That cavity lasted years. Chain link fencing and plywood sheets try to keep people out, but there were gaps where the fence was held together loosely. And after a while, it said, fuck it, it fell apart. It was a reluctant cemetery. Seven women, four men, and a little kid, 21 months. There was sadness, anger, 
People built altars and trash sculptures in there and painted graffiti murals on the walls, letters 10 foot high that stretched from several yards across, 12 dead landlord arson. In the winter, the pit filled with pools of gray murky water, a cream muck floating, swirling. I stood on the street in the rain, looking way down to the floor, fingers curled on the wires, puddles formed, and the dirt darkened. Sometimes, there were candles on the altars, the ones in the tall glass jars like they sold at the Walgreens. They were lit and I saw them flicker in the dim afternoon light. I waited to see if the raindrops would put the candles out. How did the people crawl down there? It must have been like jumping into an empty pool, tiled walls slick and the lip unreachable. So then, how did they get out, I thought. For weeks, it's rained like when I was little and now there is a pond on 22nd Street. The bulldozers are gone and the bottom is covered with wild grass and weeds like dandelion and sour grass and anise and foxtails and city wheat, thick and overgrown, proudly natural. Someone climbed over the black wrought iron fence to plant a bright pink rose bush. It's almost beautiful. Mm -hmm. There are frogs there, there now. I hear them at night when I walk home from doing laundry. I stop and peek through the sturdy bars. The water is unbroken, a few lights reflect off its surface, but I can't see anything move. Then suddenly, the misplaced racket echoes. The croaking is pleasant. It sounds like joy. But how did they get in there? They can't be red-legged frogs. Those are the only frogs native to San Francisco, but they're rare, endangered. They're found in a few places in the city, spots in Golden Gate Park, maybe Glen Park Canyon, but they couldn't have made it here alone. They're little frogs. Maybe someone let a pet bullfrog loose or somehow frog eggs made it to the water carried by a bird. I don't know, but there are definitely frogs croaking in the pit. They're loud at night and you can hear them if you stop and stand still. Thank you again for having me in this space. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Kim. Thank you everybody at Loop. Very much appreciate it. Thank you so much, Norman. It's always good to hear you talk story. Our next reader is Shika Malavia, who is an Indian American poet, writer, and publisher. She's co-founder of the Great Indian Poetry Collective, a mentorship model press publishing powerful voices from India and the Indian diaspora. Her poetry has been nominated for the Pushcart Prize and featured in Catamaran, Bloom, Prairie Schooner, and other fine publications. She has been featured as a TEDx speaker and was selected as Poet Laureate of San Ramon, California in 2016. She's been an AWP poetry mentor in their Writer to Writer program for six seasons and is currently a Mosaic America Fellow committed to cultural collaboration in the San Francisco Bay Area and beyond. Her book of historical persona poetry in her own voice, Poems of the Anam Devai Joshi, is forthcoming in 2023. Her previous book of poems was Geography of Tongues. It was amazing. Please welcome to this microphone, Shika. Oh, thank you so much, Kim. Um, it's such an honor to be here which, um, with uh, such powerful voices. Um, I've been so moved by hearing everybody's words and um, wow, I'm just like in awe of all that I've heard so far. Um, and thank you to Aunt Lute also, to Emma. Um, just really honored to be in the presence of all of you um, and to those who are listening today. So, um, the first poem I'm going to share is actually a poem which I'd written for National Day of Racial Healing and for Santa Clara County. Um, and it was the day right after um, uh, President Biden and Kamala Harris had been uh, inaugurated. And the poem is called The Morning After. Uh, Kim, I think you've heard this one before, but I'm gonna read it anyway. The Morning After. Dear America, there's a crumpled poem on the floor that I wrote the night before, listing all the reasons why this brown girl should have left you. But today is that glorious morning after four long years of undoing, unbecoming. And we are purple from taking a beating, shades of red, white, and blue melded like dawn's early light before the sun 
fully rises. On my street in the land of the Ohlone, I spy a box of lemons in the middle of January, glowing citrus orbs free for the taking. And someone is giving away flower bulbs, a basketball hoop, a slow cooker. This is the America I embrace, the one that's generous, the one that says life's a little sweet, a little sour, the one that helps us all flourish and bloom, an America that says, let's play, let's cook for one another, even in the midst of a pandemic as we eat alone together. I grew up in the land of the Dakota Sioux near the Mississippi River in a state whose name means cloudy water, Minnesota, where George Floyd lost his life last year, a few miles away from where my children were born two decades before. And I worry about the legacy they inherit, about how they might be regarded, about what will be there to save and savor if we have already destroyed it. And I believe things have changed and will keep changing. That girl who sat in the school cafeteria all alone because others thought her brownness was contagious is now part of a chorus of poets that believe the moment of change is the only poem. And America, I thank you for letting me be more than one thing to be able to say namaste as well as hello, to hold steady the ground beneath my feet. When others said, go back where you came from, to see a reflection of myself in the whitest house in the land where an Indian Jamaican American woman whose name means Lotus in my mother tongue will be second in command. And we begin again to break down walls and break through ceilings, to be lotus seeds that seem dormant for many years, yet burst open during floods, growing slow and deep through mud. There's a Native American proverb, tribe unknown, no river can return to its source, yet all rivers must have a beginning. America, land of beginnings for all, where each day is a new opportunity, we begin again and again until we all learn to begin better. Okay, <laughs> so um, the next poem, uh, next few poems I'd like to read are based on, um, it's on a historical persona uh, poetry project, um, which um, is on, based on the life of Anandi Gopal Joshi, also known as Anandi Bai, who lived in the 19th century from 1865 to 1887. Anandi Bai was India's first female physician, and she was also the first Indian woman to enter the United States in 1883 to pursue an education in medicine. She lived here in the United States for three years at a time when Orientalism and exoticism in the United States was at its peak. Now, I came upon Anandi Bai and her story when I was searching for who the first Indian woman was to come to the United States to dig deeper into that slur, which I constantly heard growing up in the Midwest, go back to where you came from. For most Indian immigrants in the United States, our history in this land often goes back just a generation or two. And that was the case for my family as well. I knew others had come before us, but there was no mention in history books and there was no book which I could find that contained this information separately. So Anandi Bai's life story is a compelling one uh, of empowerment, American and Indian allyship, but it's also proof that others had come before us and, that's, and that where we come from is made up of many places. By telling her story, my hope has been to not only restore Anandi Bai's agency and give her story back to her, but to also give the South Asian American community back a deeper history. So this first poem, um, it's about when she comes here to the United States and she's been accepted in medical school and there's a reception held for her because everyone is fascinated with this woman that's come from India. They've never seen anybody like her. They called me Lady of the Orient, Philadelphia, September, 1883. Though the darkest one in the room, I'm the brightest of them all in a red Bithambar sari deemed Pompeian, bell of this ball. And as I shake their hands, 500 pairs wearing gloves to protect myself and them, they regard the spray of pearls hanging from my nose, my filigreed wrists of bangles glinting gold, 
the tiny kunku dot on my broad forehead drawing stares and praise for this young Hindu lady so brave having come all the way alone from Serampore to the city of brotherly love to earn her doctor's coat. Mazenao Anandi Ahe, I want to say in my native tongue so that I don't forget who I am, the young girl whose books once lay tattered in the cow shed, whose baby lived barely 10 days. I float like an Indian rose among a dark sea of cinched waists and bonnets in the parlor of the Dean of the Women's Medical College, smiling till my cheeks hurt as they stumble out a new version of my name, Ananda Bai, remarking how exquisite is my English. And then um, this next poem is about how after she's lived in America for a while, how you know people have been very nice to her and accommodating, but at the same time, their comments about where she comes from have been derogatory in one way or another, or ignorant rather. <clears throat> Under their veil of kindness. In every corner of this country, kindness. They love me so dearly here, I do not feel alone or far from home. The children greet me politely, the laundress charges me less, and the dean of the medical college, her heart so large, she gives me a place at her hearth when she sees I am but a mess, trying to cook then rush for classes, how to ever repay such a debt, their generosity as big as their country. And I am stubborn in what I eat and how I dress, lentils and rice for all meals with the occasional egg. My kunku, my bangles, my sari, I don throughout all seasons, wrapping it in such a fashion that no cold may sleep in. I like this bit of difference in which they regard me, praise my foreignness, how in me they see my motherland, and yet their remarks, like leaves fallen on a lake, sometimes float with ignorance. Do your homes in India have windows? How do you see God in stone? Why are your brides so young? Are there many women where you come from? To them, we are smug in our heathenness, the missionaries who come back echoing the same, and so it is up to me to pierce through their many veils. And then um, this next poem that I'm going to read, it's, um, it's a poem based on a photograph uh, where there are three women. One of them is Anandi Bai and she's dressed in a uh, beautiful sari. Um, and then next to her is a Japanese, um, woman who's dressed in a kimono and then next to the Japanese woman is a Syrian uh, woman who is in um, her you know native clothes and uh, she's got a beautiful headdress of coins and when you see this photograph it's very arresting and it's also very exotic and you wonder what are these three women from three different cultures doing and um, then um, you know, when you read more about it, you find out all three of them are doctors and all three of them have come from their respective countries to study medicine in Philadelphia in the 19th century. And that, you know, just the thought of that really uh, blew my mind. And so I wrote a poem based on that photograph. When they asked us to pose for a photograph at the Women's Medical College reception, Philadelphia, 1885. Forgive us if we don't smile, the ocean scent, still on our clothes, still on our clothes, the stench of sea. We, visitors of another clime, of warmer lands are we. With pride, we wear our native clothes, silk and jewels we proudly don, sari, kimono, headdress of coins, with lyre, sash, a handheld fan, no scalpel, stethoscope, or degree. Three female doctors, a foreign pedigree, playing dress up for Western eyes. In our appearance, they see worlds wild. Forgive us if we don't smile. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shika. Oh, wow. It's really rich stuff, huh? Our last reader is Rena J. Leon, PhD, who is a Black Afro Boricua and from Philadelphia, Lenny Lenape ancestral lands. She's a mother, a daughter, a sister, madrina, comadre, partner, poet, writer, and teacher educator. 
She believes in collective action and community work, the profound power of holding space for the telling of our stories and the liberatory practice of humanizing education. She seeks out communities of care and craft and is a member of the Carolina African American Writers Collective, Kavi Kanum, Cantomundo, Macondo. She is the author of Canticle of Idols, Boogeyman Dawn, Sombra, Dislocate, and the chapbooks Profeta Without a Refuge, Without Refuge, and Areto to Atabe, Essays on the Mothering Self. She publishes across forms in visual art, poetry, nonfiction, fiction and scholarly work. She has received fellowships and residencies with the Obsidian Foundation, Community of Writers, Montana Artists Refuge, McDowell, Kimmel Harding, Nelson Center for the Arts, Vermont Studio Center, the Tyrone Guthrie Center in Anna Carrig, Ireland, and Ragdale, among others. She's the founding editor of the Ascentos Review, an online quarterly international journal devoted to promotion and publication of Latinx arts. She educates our present and future agitators and educators as a full professor of education at St. Mary's College of California, only the third black person, all black women, and the first Afro-Latina to achieve that rank there. She is additionally a digital archivist, emerging visual artist, writing coach, and curriculum developer. Welcome, 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 Raina. <laughs> My gosh, <laughs> thank you, Kim. <laughs> I'm so grateful to be here with you all. This reading is so amazing. I have been breathing very deeply as I have um, taken into my spirit all of these um, incredible, revolutionary, resilient, resistant words. I am so honored to be with you. I um, I'm so grateful to, um, to Aunt Lut and Emma and um, Kim and the whole collective of, of us together, Quivui and Landon and Ma, uh, Ma and Norman and Chika, again, so, so grateful. And I, I recognize that I don't come only into any room by myself. So I come to you as Reina, but also holding within me all of my peoples. And so I, um, recite some of their names to speak to my ancestors who are with me. Um, and Norma and Queen Esther and Sarah and Eliza and Lizzie and Lydia and Sarah and Albert and folks like Solomon and William and Rachel and Venancia and Angelina, Juanita, Maria Antonia, Concepcion, Venancia, Antonio, um, Lariano, Juana, Marcelino, and indeed, I will um, share with you the names of all those whose names I know um, in the chat. <laughs> um, and I have been learning more and more about my people um, over these um, many years. And I have still so much more to learn. Um, I also wanna invite you as I'm reading to, um, to download this app. I know it's a strange request, um, but it's called Halo AR. And if you download that, I will share at the end of my conversation with you all, my, my work with you, um, one piece from Instagram. It appears in my new book and it's a visual poem called Sasi Puedes. Um, it's in the Instagram link that I've just shared in the chat. And if you have that on your screen, and you have Halo AR on your phone, then you can point your phone to the screen and have a mini poem for augmented reality. <laughs> and it's in the book as well, the book to come, which I've dropped into the chat, um, Black God, Mother of This Body. Um, before I read um, some poems and um, a prose poem piece, I also wanna um, share there that um, the Essentials Book Prize is something that I also wanna announce. <laughs> it's a partnership with Nomadic Press um, and it's an extension of a long history of Essentials in supporting Latinx um, arts. And we have three amazing judges, including Alan Pelas Lopez and Peggy Robles Alvarado and Raquel Salas Rivera. So a community of judges who are working together to identify a book um, 
that we will publish with Nomadic um, as part of this prize. So, um, so honored to also be in this conversation with Nomadic and Atlut and Black Freighter um, in this community. Here's some work. Unhand. Who will love this wicked nail? Split down the middle, dried and hardened skin on the left and lima bean curve on the right or it's near twin on my right hand. Will they ever grow back? I remember my mother asking the doctor in his white coat stethoscope around his neck. Perfect nails is what she wanted. Phantoms of never was. My daughter has a similar marking for her. It's her two index fingernails, both with a flat dip into the nail bed. Fully formed, but shaped like spades pointed up as if ready to dig. Our hands must be an ancestral remnant. I, who am a budding genealogist, know that such details would be impossible to find. There are no records that archive birthmarks of any sort. It is the fact of birth, the time, the date, perhaps the day the major players, parents, hospital, place, those are marked. Congenital defects, because any oddity is a defect, are named only when they kill or threaten to kill. Congenital heart disease congenital liver disease. I call them aunt or Bobby. There are many stories, but whose nails were like mine before mine? I'll never find those names. I could ask my thumbs or my daughter's index fingers, who are people be? But digits don't speak. Together our hands could form two pincers. Maybe they could pinch the story out of the ether. Where did this unique mark begin? And in every generation, who adored that oddity like a sweetening? The next um, poems are from the new book. Mother Fear. There are birds on the water, feather flight and swirling vortex. You would know her name if she and you could sing like the nightingale or swift with their tails, nanostructurally composed to shine as they set down and alight. They conjure in this internal world set to their spinning by a glint syringe, science, the magician of creation, all worlds crumble and crash. This one in a dilated door. Labor has its own clock unless a doctor ordains a being just a murmuration of swallows or a murder under a bloody sheet. Um, this poem is one in which the god Thoth, um, the god of wisdom, becomes a woman in the mirror with this text from the Code of Hammurabi um, from Law 127. If anyone point the finger at a sister of a God or the wife of anyone and cannot prove it, this man shall be taken before the judges and his brow shall be marked. I watch her with my blue film eye skimmed thin to oracle her future. Watch the moon open her face, calculate her preening and weather today. Beneath the clouds, a lovesick waltz. Tomorrow, gaslight apocalypse. How many times has the law told a woman, your name is wound that should gape? How many times has a doctor told a woman, your body is a knob? for my turning. I could write the numbers on a mountain made of glass and need to form more from all time's sands. I see spirit worms rippling beneath our skin, mambo frenzy, twist twine gourd, rattlesnake. She dreams and pointed fingers. The flares will always come. Better to be a moon hawked. It is still a heavenly body. And I'll offer you this one poem before the, um, the note around that um, visual poem. Eden had four rivers. Uh, what I should tell you about this last poem is that I, my, my daughter is a pandemic baby, um, was born in a COVID isolation ward. And although I did not ultimately have COVID, um, the test coming back negative four times, um, there were many times in that space of 
begging for food um, and being denied. Um, my daughter fighting to keep her with me, um, fighting for the uh, nursing staff to not remove her from the room before resuscitating her. Um, and they also wanted to steal my placenta for pathology purposes. Here's the problem. Eden had four rivers. After the birth and the afterbirth, the midwife lifts the placenta to show how from womb we are all elemental. Beloved, suckered from a veiny tree, a, the assigned boy child was e easy, querido, querida, queridas. We took the organ of our lineage, a treasured gift of our waters and roots, iced and carried in a bloody plastic bag, a budding, and contributed its last work to fig. After the assigned girl child, wherever you go from around to within, we had to steal what they wanted to study. Mother as creature made possible pathology. We brought a cooler and guarded it. Peaches now rise in a garden that feeds other mouths. Breath, ancestor, los ancestros que todavía respiran, están respirando sus canciones. Trees rose and the roots talked to one another. All creatures listened and knew one language. They moved like water. We see you adapting to one another and in the water we be you that fed the water and trees and all living things you be we there was wisdom and memory passed on aretos atabe remembered in stone on a metal tray strength current wherever there is water and earth a deliverer holds up a blood tree roots the bridge between death life and dream, fleshy Eden, listen to the voices still whispering there before the clot, springtime and mule and eyelash flutter, our and your own, yes. And I offer you again um, the poem that I'll drop here from, um, that you can just get from Instagram. As a closing, if you have that app later, you can look at the image and see another visual poem. It's such a joy to be with you. Thank you so much. You were all incredible. These 10 years since the death of my daughter, my heart has become a detector for family. And when we talk about home, what we're talking about is a place for family. And I just need to say to you all that as we continue to explore what it means to be gentrified out of our homes, that we need to continue to make open space in our hearts for places and people to witness for each other. I thank you so much for this evening. Thank you to Aunt Lou. Thank you to everybody. I was very pleased to be here and listen to everybody's wisdom. Have a lovely evening. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Kim. Oh my goodness. What a... I'm still sort of reeling from the idea that someone was trying to steal Raina's placenta. So I'm a little frazzled by that thought, but I just cannot express enough gratitude for what an amazing experience this reading has been. And I want to invite everyone, all of our readers to come back if you're still here and turn your camera on, we can take a group photo. And I want to thank, as we're all popping up, our partner organization, Sagarayate Land Trust, Poor Magazine, Poets Reading the News, the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project, Black Freighter. Um, you all have done such an amazing job um, and I really appreciate all of the work you've done and our funder, California Humanities. Um, but yeah, I guess I'm gonna take a quick screenshot. <laughs> so everybody, yeah, it's not gonna count down or anything. Everyone look how you wanna look. Uh, all right. <laughs> So thank you so much. We're throwing some surveys into the chat. Um, and I will be distributing the recording of this event, um, especially because this has been so special. I'll try to share the chat as well. I think if any of you have been in there, it's been really fun. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, thank you all so much. Please join us next uh, for the next event, July 20th. Uh, it's going to hopefully look and feel a lot like this. I'm so excited to be a part of this with all of you. It's really a wonderful experience to build community with you all. All right. Thank you all so much. I hope everyone has a good evening. Bye.